Hello, welcome to Your Call, live on FEC TV. Tonight we're going to be delving back into the topic of China, uh, looking primarily at where they're going to go in the future. I'm joined tonight by two guests, uh, David O'Brien from the Centre for Asian Studies at uh, University College Cork and Barry Murphy. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, now, I'm going to kick us off here with a bit of a quote from The Economist. The Economist said, uh, I think, I believe last year, China's economy is unfair and inefficient, but it's not unstable. Now, I want to sort of jump on this, um, David, if I may. How unstable is China really? Well, stability is uh, pretty much the guiding force that behind everything uh, the Chinese do at the moment, politically, economically, uh, socially. And the origins of that come from its recent history, the turmoil of the past hundred years, which we spoke a little bit about last week, but sure. uh, you know they're coming out of a, a situation where they had been a hundred years of basic upheaval, turmoil, uh, social disintegration, famine, war, you name it. And f since uh, you know the communists came to power in '49, there has been as much turmoil as before they came to power. Absolutely. But that changed somewhat in recent years, particularly with the opening up. Uh, from 1978 onwards. Uh, but there is this maybe innate fear, I think it can be said, of it all sort of tripping back into that again. Yeah, I mean, do you see this, you, you, you're talking about stability, you know, as the, the key factor here. Does this sort of allow them, or within the sort of Chinese consciousness, allow acts, you know, the sabotaging of, of journalists' uh, laptops and, and, and things, uh, forcing the New York Times journalist out of the country, the um, sort of persecution of Ai Weiwei or Li Xiaobo, the, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, does that sort of allow them in their, their mindset to, to get away with things like that almost, because it's in the name of stability? Well, um, when it comes to what you would use the term persecution of, or you would use it, you know, the way you describe it, that's not how they would see it. They would see it as upholding the, the right of the people to live in a stable environment. And I suppose this is, I suppose, a stable environment that, that doesn't have the freedom of speech, that doesn't right. have mm. the, the sort of things that I suppose those of us in, let's say, the West or, or would believe a, a civilized society mm. should have. Mm. Well, in, 19, in 2009, there were very severe uh, riots in the northwest of the country, uh, in Xinjiang province. Uh, there were ethnic riots that were, there was a lot of factors at play. But one of the results of that was that the government blocked the internet in the region, and they blocked it for a whole year. Uh, you could not access the internet in Xinjiang, anywhere in Xinjiang, bar one hotel which they offered to foreign journalists to cover the situation. Now that remained, it remained blocked for, for a whole year. Uh, they also blocked Facebook, they blocked Twitter, they blocked all of these things and they remain blocked up to now, to, to today. Um, now when it comes to a situation whereby A, they can do it, they, they have the capabilities to do it, and B, they are prepared to make the economic sacrifices that come with blocking the internet in a region, a region which is the size of Spain, France, Germany, uh, and Britain put together, uh, it gives you an idea of uh, what stability... You yeah, know, what stability means to them as opposed to what it means to us. But what do you think, David, um, like how, how much control can they keep? I mean, at what point, like I would have the opinion, right, that the only p people that are going to break China becoming a world dominant power mm. are the Chinese. Yeah, I think that's, a, it's a, it's a, that's, that's it. That? Yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. But I, I mean, think if they get de if they get democratic freedom and they um, are able to voice like the hunt, there was a hundred journalists. Yeah. That's right. There's a southern, the southern mm. star um, newspaper strike that is obviously mm. st still ongoing. Yeah, I mean, there, there was a, someone interviewed about it today, uh, mm. uh, today or yesterday, who was then thrown into the back mm. of a minivan and driven off mm. by, by plainclothes mm. policemen. So, you know, this, this type of thing is still going on. But yeah. Barry, Barry, you've got a, a great point there that how long yeah, I mean, can this, can this clamp right. down last? Well, they're playing a funny game, in my opinion, in as much as, you know, they're becoming more democratic, more Western, more middle class, more um, open commercially. And at the same time, they're trying to contain. Mm. And that, that's a very fine line yeah. to be walking. It's a very fine line to be walking. And, and, and yet, that sometimes that fine line trips into almost paranoia. I mean, the recent uh, uh, party congress that met to 
elect the new leadership. It's held, it's held every five years and takes place in the Great Hall of the People in, in Tiananmen Square in Beijing. Uh, the security uh, presence around that was absolutely astonishing and at times ludicrous and almost comical. One of the things they did in Beijing during that Congress was they banned balloons. There were no balloons. You couldn't get a balloon in Beijing because they were worried people would put slogans onto the balloons and release them over the, over yeah. the square. Another thing they did was they, and this is absolutely true, is it, 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 sounds like, it sounds like it's something made up, but it, it, it was absolutely true. They removed all of the, the, little, the little handles from the windows of taxis uh, so that to prevent people from driving past the square, oh, rolling down the windows, shouting out uh, comments. They banned, all knives were banned from the... Yeah, uh, how far can they control that? How, how far can they can control it? it? They can control it in the sense that... I don't mean how far, for how mm. long? Like, if you take yeah. now, you have 100 journalists that yeah. are going out on strike or in a demonstration. I mean, where is that 100 journalists going to be in five years' time? Yeah, well... Is it going yeah, to be a million? 10,000, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think you're right. And also, I mean... They do have the Great Firewall. They, they, they can shut down the internet. But, you know, on the flip side of that, China has some of the best hackers, the best internet people in the world. Mm. So there are ways to get around this. There are ways to get messages out, you know, in, in terms of that. So it's almost that, as I see it, they're, they're papering over the cracks. Mm. But how long can that go on? Yeah, yeah but the key question is that the point that you're making is that they can do it. They have the know-how, the, te the, the capability, the, the technical knowledge and the incentive they see to do it. But how long will the people tolerate it? How long will the people will put up with it? Uh, you can control the internet and they can control it to a large extent, probably much more so than anybody else. But you can't control what people feel or what they say to one another or how they, how they interpret the situation or how they view uh, their own lives within this bigger uh, thing. Now, you remember that a lot of their legitimacy had its origin in, 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 in political, uh, uh, you know, in, in Marxist political theory. Uh, they don't have elections, they don't have, you know, the normal things that legitimise governments in other, in, in, in other countries. Uh, what does legitimise them now, the only thing that legitimises them, is the economic development of the country. And if it continues to go the way it's going, then the feeling is, I think, within the government, within the, the party, that a lot of these uh, questions that people might have or, 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 or some of these challenges they might make will be subsumed by that. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's, a, let's actually talk about that a little bit more and let's, let's sort of flip that. Just to say to those uh, watching us out there, if you do have any questions, please contact us on uh, Twitter or Facebook and we'll, we'll pass them across to David. Um, I'm going I'm to flip that, um, the, the what you're saying there. If we're, if we're looking at the economics and that the economics are the thing driving it forward, would we see in that case that if the economics keep going, the middle class keeps growing, the, you know, the education keeps getting better, will that lead potentially to the fall of the one-party system as we see it now? And would it be replaced with something else? In terms, so my question to you is, will the one-party system continue? Um, well, uh, I don't see it changing anytime soon. Uh, I don't see the new leadership announcing in the morning that there will be... Uh, Democratic well, election. Fall of the Berlin Wall no, you're not going to have it, and, and, and that's the, but that's you see, that's the key point of it because, you know, they're looking at it, and they're looking at exactly that. They're looking at the '89 and the fall of the Berlin Wall in '91, and they're looking at maybe what happened in the Soviet Union under Gorbachev, under Perestroika and Glasnost, and this idea of opening up and reform, and they see that as being one of the direct causes of the fall of the Soviet Union. And they look at themselves, they're still there, they're still in power, they still have, you know, uh, complete dominance. But that wasn't the cause of the, uh, the, f the fall of the Soviet Union, though. I mean, the in Soviet Chinese, Union... Well, the, the, Chi uh, the Soviet Union was goosed anyway. Well, it was probably goosed anyway. It yeah. was definitely goosed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were completely out there. But let's try and flip this another way again, okay, right? Okay, go ahead. Supposing we turn around and we take the theory that we're in Ireland, we have three or four political parties, the same as the UK or anywhere else. They're all squabbling amongst each other. We have 27 countries in the Euro, I think, mm -hmm. um, and they're all squabbling against each other looking for a piece of a pie. Mm -hmm. So in each country, we have three or four parties squabbling. And then we've got, maybe we should be going the China way. Maybe, we should, maybe it's not the China should be going um, mm -hmm. the Western way, the democratic way. But maybe that, maybe, maybe that that's an, an interpretation which sees the Communist Party as a, as a unified party. Uh, the Communist Party is 85 million members. Uh, within the leadership of that party, you have a huge variety of different views and different opinions and different groupings and different cliques yes, and different they powers. They'll do, they'll do what they're told of. Well, the recent transition uh, of leadership 
brought about a lot of things to the fore between different power groups within the party, different cliques within the party. And there was one particular clique uh, led by a guy called Bo Xilai, who was the uh, party chief of the city of Chongqing, a very important city in the centre of China. And he, if you may remember, this was the, the very strange case of the Englishman that was murdered. Oh, yeah, oh the yeah. business, the business. Yeah. yeah, and it was his wife has been convicted of uh, murdering him. Now, whatever the ins and outs of that extraordinary story, <coughs> which, is, you know, which is something like from a Green Green novel, uh, the reality of it is, is that Bo Xilai is in prison, He's, there he will stay, and the figurehead of the, the, the branch of the party that wanted to go back to the old, more leftist ways, uh, is taken out of the scene. Now with that you've left a significant power vacuum within the party, which nobody knows quite how that's going to be filled. Uh, so the idea that maybe uh, that there is somehow a one party which speaks with yeah, one right. voice. Okay, but there's still a way more one party than we'll say the likes of yours. I suppose the thing, the thing to go to, to sort of counter your point, Barry, would be that yes, it, yes, it sort of works um, for the Chinese. And it, it, clearly, it clearly is, if we look at it economic terms, it is, it is working. If we look at the, the social and the human rights terms, perhaps not so much. And that's the way you would have to look at it if you Absolutely. wanted to implement it in the West, that we are too far gone to go to that system now, that there's been too much water under the bridge, because, I mean, I suppose my question to you would be then, uh, Barry, would people, let's say in Ireland, if this system was put in front of them and, and they turned around to the Irish people and said, we'll get you out of the economic crisis, we'll give you 10% growth for the next 30 years, however, yeah. you have to give up a few freedoms, would, would you think that would be something that well, would, well, would be taken the, up? The funny thing about that, uh, as far as I can see, would be um, we're losing about 14 billion a year in Ireland, right? Of a, of a, budget, a budget of about 36, 38 billion, something like that. Now, if we kept losing that kind of type of money, at some point we would go bust, simple bust. Now, when people are bust, that's when things change, you know what I mean? That, like, yeah, I mean, his, his, historically, that is the time when, the, let's say, the more extreme elements do tend to come out yeah. um, in, 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 any, in any party. But whether or not people would, would, uh, would embrace communism... Well, China, China are the only country making money as a country, aren't they? One of the very few, anyway. Well, well, making well, money in terms of large amounts, yeah, certainly. I mean, but but the, the, I mean, there's one interpretation of that is, 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 you know, the Chinese economy has grown at double-digit figures for the last 10 years. But from where? But from where? Exactly. Uh, for, certainly. And um, how sustainable it is, is it? Uh, has it plateaued? And there's also an aspect of it is that there's some economists in China, Chinese economists, have argued quite, quite convincingly that if growth drops below a certain level, people make the point maybe 7%, if it drops below 7%, you will see a serious slowdown in the economy, and with that will come a massive uh, upsurge up in civil, civil unrest, unrest and disorder. Yeah. So in order to prevent that from happening, there's an artificiality to their economy, some economists would say, that you know, when the world economy went, you know, went very flat in, in, in 07, they pumped massive amounts of, of state money into construction and into maintaining and all and of this and, and it's continuing the value of the yen. Yeah. 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 And but that this is this is something to look look at then. Mm. In terms of the economy going forward, there there are there are two opposing views here. There you know there are some who think that by let's say twenty eighteen, some even say twenty sixteen that the Chinese economy is gonna rapidly overtake the US and become the dominant superpower in terms of economics in the world. There are others who suggest quite rightly, um, that potentially it could go the other way, as you were talking about the, the slowdown and thing. And the problem there is that the key is that China needs to spend themselves, that the Chinese need to buy their own products, yeah. rather than because the exports drying up, the foreign investment has gone in a, you know, a long time ago and set itself up and there's a, a bit of protectionism there now. So it's down to the Chinese to spend. I mean, yes, I think you'll agree, Western China large amounts to, to still do, yeah. but there is the case there that the Chinese need to buy Chinese products. Yeah, but I, I also see well, from being over there and over and back, I mean, the amount of, they, they, they came in, I mean, they work with leather as well, right? Mm. So they bought the, the cattle hides, they set up tanneries in China, of, say, 50, 15, 20 years ago, and they started to produce leather, and they made a bags of it. Everything mm. they touched was a disaster. Mm. Then they came to Europe, they took the best boys out of the Italian tanners and this, Give him yeah, a fellow 50 years of age, give him a million euros, come over here for five years and you can retire. 
And now they are copying everything to a T. They're, they're making, like Gucci bags that are supposed to be Italian or wherever they're, they are now all made. The leather's yeah, all the processed. The Chinese China. middle class want the real Gucci. Yeah. They don't want the knockoffs. I actually do have a question. Well, well, that's not a knockoff, yeah. But the, it's the, the copy there is, the, is, is no, the, no, what no, the Chinese are They're making want. the leather for oh, yeah. the genuine product. I actually have a question come in uh, on, on the Twitter feed uh, here by a chap called John Ricey. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, a question for yourself, Dave. He says, look at Shanghai this week with all the pollution. And there were, mm. there were stories there of, of the pollution levels rising quite significantly. He says, it's easy to make money when discounting everything else. Mm. And I suppose he's got a point there. Mm. Yes, it's, it's very easy if you knock down human rights and you pay yeah, people sure. nothing. I mean, yeah, and, uh, and, and that's where it is at. Yeah, and that's a very good point. And there's no doubt that environmentally, uh, China has made serious sacrifices for its economy and for its, uh, its industrial it's development. You've sort of called them sacrifices mm. as well. It's, an, it's a sort of an interesting way to look at mm. that because, you know, a, a lot of people will come on and say they're not sacrifices, yeah. they're absolute damage. Yeah, I suppose I'm speaking more in terms yeah, of how yeah. the government yeah. see it than my own, my own, no, my yeah. own view. But they would He's see taking it. the party <laughs> line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They would <laughs> too much radio China. <laughs> yeah, they, but they would see it as that. But in terms of how 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 uh, that has, and going back to sort of the, the the earlier point, that one of the most contentious issues in China today are environmental issues. One of the things that has people out protesting on the streets, the thing that that uh, not just pollution, but land disputes and um, you know yeah, river yeah. massive. Soil erosion. Massive, massive soil erosion. Foul. Yeah, it's absolutely. Yeah, dangerous. I mean, you'll be yeah. able to tell from experience. Yeah. I mean, it, it is. It's really, really, really bad. You never see a blue sky. You never. never, never you never, never. It's always the same the haze that sits over the city. And, and, it, and is, is that in terms then, if we're looking at China in the future, is that something that they're going to have to tackle? Well, they should have been tackling mm. ten years ago, but ha are going to have to tackle immediately uh, as they go on? Because, as we said before, as we said all along, the middle class is getting more and more, and they're the people who are not going to put up with that kind of thing. Well, they, again, the, the, the thinking maybe within the, within, the, within the government would be that, you know, Britain went through something similar with its Industrial Revolution, that, you know, with, with, with comes, and this comes back to the old thinking that, you know, as the economy develops, everything will improve with it, and a lot of these other things will become less uh, problematic, whereas the feeling is, you know, it's too late now to do anything about it uh, among some of the people. Um, but, yeah, the environment is, like, the environment in China is incredibly important for uh, people's view of their government and their guardianship of their nation and things. Barry, if you were if you were looking at the future of China, where do where do you see them going yourself? Well, I, yeah, I, I think from my own, just from my own experience observing, I mean, as far as I know, they traded, they had billions and billions of US dollars on hold or trillions maybe. Yeah, I yeah they got eight percent of the, the US the, debt. Yeah, and they they bought was it the Bra Brazilian or Mexican oil rights with it mm. because they wanted to get rid of the dollar and they bought the oil in one of those two South American countries. It's actually a really interesting point you're making there, and I can come back into it. We've got a, a Twitter feed which, which is exactly pertinent to that. Uh, Chris Reddy has said, is the usurping of resources from developing countries like that in Africa the next stage of China's world domination? And that's exactly what you're saying there, this, this power of going into the South American countries, into Africa. It, it's a soft power move, they would see it, but it is securing resources, natural resources, well, for the long term. I read on one of your, one of our clever writers' articles there over the last week that 60% of the world's arable land is in Africa. I couldn't believe it. Mm. I mean, when I saw that statistic, the and last you, place yeah. you think it was. And, and China, China has an extreme, Ooh, shor yeah, and there's an extreme shortage of, of arable land of its own and has already bought up large tracts of Africa to specifically grow things in, and they're doing it in other parts of, uh, of South America as well. I suppose it goes back to this, it's the one party with this very long-term view of things. Mm, exactly. Well, that's they can, they the, that's the key. That's right, they can have it, because their, their, their government, in, as it is now, is stable. And you were asked, Chris asked you the question, can you see this one government policy changing? And you said not any time soon. No. So, I mean, if you were there and you were the leader of a government, or of a country of 1.3 billion people with the resources they have, and you can make 10-year plans. Mm. That's the difference. Whereas in Ireland or in the West, mm. the the, um, the government will promise you anything the year before an election, mm. throw money all over the place to get re-elected. Mm. Um, then they get in, they drop the hammer on you for two years, yeah. and then they start being nice again. Yeah. Whereas well, these people can can plan mm. out 10 years. Yeah, but they, 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 there's no, I don't see it. I don't see it changing anytime soon. But I don't think if you were sitting in Berlin in 1989, in October 89, you would have seen the wall fall in a month from now, Absolutely. a month from then. Uh, the 
events uh, sometimes take over. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and, well, it's very possible. You know, and, 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 and anything could happen in a situation. You've got to remember, like, China is a country in which, according to its own figures, its own figures released up until 2006, it used They'd to release every year. How many, uh, well, there you'd imagine they would be yeah. anywhere. Or they'd probably in, be in some way, shape, or form. Some, but they had, in the region of 60,000 what they call mass incidents uh, a year. Now, they, that, I mean, to be correct, I'd say they're probably substantially like under unrest. civil unrest. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that's, you know, that, like, that, that, that's, that's a very, very, very significant amount of civil unrest. A couple would work, you know. Well, it depends on how you deal with it. It depends on how you deal with it. And that's the they key might point. It last the 10 minutes. Yeah, well, that's the key point. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when we're wrapping this up, there, there's, there's, a, there's a fantastic debate, um, a bit of a bet that's gone on um, between Professor Michael Pettis and The Economist magazine, um, to go back to The Economist again. They've made this fantastic bet, which uh, the prize is a bottle of uh, China's finest liquor. Um, over whether or not China will be the dominant econo economic power in um, essentially the next sort of 10, 10 to 15 years. So I'd, I'd like a very, very quick opinion while we're wrapping this up now uh, in terms of a, a sort of a yes or no, slight qualification of where do we think it's going to be? Is it going to be there? Are they going to be the dominant superpower? Barry. I think David just answered it um, in as much as while, there's a, while they're going in the direction they're going, while they have control, um, yes, they will be. Um, I think they're definitely going to move further uh, ahead. But as David just said, in my opinion, I think he's correct. Um, that could change just like that. Mm. And one of those things, I suppose, again, coming in from, from the final tweet of the night, I suppose, is something like the, the, the infighting between Japan and China over, uh, over the Inland Islands, mm. um, something like an, a North Korea or a Taiwan. Mm. All of those are flashpoints, which could potentially go, probably not. I but there is a potential there. Anything externally out of China can stop China. So we're going to, again, you're, you're, you're in the thing to take away from this barrier is that the only thing that can stop China in its tracks is the Chinese people themselves. That's what I believe. I, I yeah. don't, what's your opinion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like... Korea. Uh, Taiwan, Korea, various uh, aspects of the islands have, are probably not going to cause a war. But there is a sense within China that it, has, it is becoming encircled by its enemies. It's encircled particularly by America. And if you see where all these different bases are being built and current bases are and new bases are being uh, set up and things like that. But that's kind of an argument for another day. Yes. But, 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 but the, uh, I would say that the most likely cause of uh, significant political uh, change in China will not come from external force. It will come from the, uh, its, own, its own people. Is it likely to happen? I mean, it's, who can say? But, but one thing is, one thing is, and maybe a note, a, a note just to, to, on that, is that, you know, you're talking about the investments they've made in the countries, all the dollars they've bought up, all of that kind of thing. That is something that we should all sort of, you know, help us all to, you know, sleep a little bit better at night because China has such an engagement with, with, the, with, with, with the Western world, such a financial uh, connection to it, and such a need for stability. We're all sort of now partners in this. We're all yeah, partners yeah, in the stability. We, we need each other. That, how bad is that? Yeah, we need each other. They, they, they run their business yeah. as they see fit. We're working with them, and it's good. One, one final thing that I would say is that there's so much work um, and, and trade going to be done with China, and has been, obviously. And what I can't get over is Obama came here mm. and we blocked off the streets millions yeah, yeah. Went, or thousands went yeah. from millions. Thousands went out in Dublin yeah. and everything. And the next leader of yeah. China came and he was up in farms up in County Clare yeah. kick, kicking yeah. the football. Na yeah, naming, a, naming a cow after they named the cow I after. Mean, and, and America yeah. going like yeah. that and China going like no, that. I mean, We're Xi great at backing the wrong yeah. horse. I was, really <laughs> I was really struck by that. Xi Jinping came to Ireland in, Ch in China. It was a they were astounded that he would come to Ireland. We didn't even pay much attention to oh. it. Yeah. And that uh, it, it goes back to the, exactly what we were talking about last week, exactly what we've talked about mm. tonight, this, this disconnect with people in the West. Barry, yourself, you've, you've been there, you know what you're talking about. David, you've been there. A lot, the vast majority of people haven't, and that is the disconnect, that they don't see China as anything more sometimes than a threat. Mm. And that is completely the wrong way to take it. Well, I, I mean, what's the point in seeing them as a threat? Yeah. Because I mean, if they Why decided, not see an opportunity? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Well, I mean, if they decided to come after us, I'd say we'd last all mm. point zero yeah. one of a second. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, no point. We might as well be friends with them, you know. Yeah. Well, look. Thank you very much for coming on, David. Uh, really appreciate Pleasure. it, Barry. Thank you so much. Um, that was our, our excellent show on China. Check us out at fectv.com for more, and there'll be another for a uh, show of uh, your voice tomorrow night. Thank you. <laughs>